nanohub.org. Online simulation and more for nanotechnology. I am delighted to see so many people turn out to hear about quantum mechanics and uh, the promise is that it's going to be in plain English. Uh, I'm promising an equation free trip through quantum land tonight. Of course, to really properly understand the subject and feel like you've got a little bit of mastery over it, we'd have to spend a couple of years together. I'd have to spend maybe a year teaching you all of the relevant mathematics and then we'd spend another year with you practicing quantum mechanics problems. And at the end of those two years, you would feel like you understand understood it not very well. So um, it, turn, it turns out that going through all of that, you, you, you figure out that you can calculate some things, but to really deeply understand it is actually very difficult. And, and in fact, there's a really uh, fun part of this subject that is, is really best discussed at 3 a.m. in coffee shops. So that's kind of what this lecture is about today, is to give you that flavor so that when you're in those 3 a.m. coffee shop conversations, you can contribute and you can, you can even tell if you're if the person you're talking with knows any quantum mechanics or not. So the subtitle of this is how to sit in three chairs at once and speed without getting a ticket. Because if we lived in quantum land, you could do those things. So if quantum mechanics was operating uh, with, with enough uh, intensity for us to see it in our everyday life, Okay, if we lived in, I'm just gonna call it quantum land, okay? Uh, quantum mechanics is the world of the very, very, very small. So you could either think, well, if we were very, very, very small, then quantum effects would be second nature to us. They would be, oh, of course, that's how it happens. Or you could think of if quantum effects were very large, then they would happen on our everyday experience. And so if quantum effects were large and happened in our everyday experience, you would be able to sit in three chairs at once. You wouldn't have to decide whether to sit here or there or on the other side. And you could even uh, speed down the road without getting a ticket. Uh, you could even walk through walls. Um, I haven't mastered that one. I try once in a while and it just doesn't really like work. Um, but apparently in quantum land you could do it. And then all the, the sort of stuff that really comes up in the 3 a.m. conversations is, well, is this useful? Can I create my own reality? Can I do that sort of thing? You might hear that. Um, if you, um, I'm not saying I recommend this, but if you are adventurous and want to put into Google quantum mechanics, you'll get no end of ads coming up about how you can create your own reality. Uh, so we'll figure out whether that's actually true. Uh, and then the famous quote from Einstein objecting to this whole idea was, uh, God doesn't play dice. And we'll see whether Einstein was right or not. So quantum mechanics is about really small things. So think about particles, think about atoms, think about what's inside of atoms, which is electrons and protons and neutrons. Those kind of small particles obey quantum mechanics. So think of something very small, smaller than that little point, and you've probably heard this idea that particles are waves or waves are particles, this kind of idea in quantum mechanics. And so I want to give you a sense of, yes, there is this idea that when we get to the quantum level, we find out that particles really aren't little balls and they're not even little teeny tiny points. They're, they're much more smeared out. And in fact, they exhibit some properties that are very much like waves. Now, this can be confusing at first, but I recommend you just think about it this way. If I think of uh, a rather, let me, let me think about a pretty large wave here, okay? If I'm really up close to the wave, I will notice it's a wave, all right? But if I'm kind of far enough away from the wave, I won't really notice the wiggly parts, okay? We were just letting that wave go farther and farther away so that it gets small enough that it starts to look like a particle. So that's one way to think about these things is that, yes, there's a wave-like nature to them, but the wavy part is so tiny that we may as well in our everyday experience think of a lot of things as just plain old particles. And when we really get down to trying to figure out um, should we discuss the things in terms of a particle, a single uh, point-like object, or should we think of the thing as something that waves? We've actually kind of given up on this one. I shouldn't say kind of, we have, we've given up. It's neither a particle nor a wave. You could call it a wavicle if you want, but it's, kind, it's just kind of neither. We, we've, we've sort of given up. And sometimes very small, tiny objects act like particles, and sometimes they act like waves. It's going to depend on the context. But here's the key in quantum mechanics. What we find out is that these really tiny objects, these tiny particles, have some sort of wave-like character to them. Don't ask us what's waving. 
Okay, you could just say it's the matter wave that's waving, but what is that? Okay, so something is waving, all right? And it turns out that if you knew the shape of the wave, if you knew the exact details of exactly what that wavy part looked like, that would tell you what there is to know about the particle. It would tell you what the particle's doing. We call it a state. So here's an example of how the wave properties tell you what the particle's actually doing. So in, in this example that I'll show a lot, I have a wave where, well, it's kind of not doing anything here, and then it gets wiggly in the middle, and then it's not doing anything over here. So the shape of this tells us a lot about what the particle's doing. So for example, where is the particle? Well, it's somewhere in the wiggly bit, okay? So somewhere in the part that's wiggling a lot, um, there's a particle in there somewhere, but it's not out here where it's flatlined. So that's one of the things that we know about how these guys operate. And the shape of the wave tells us the other properties we would want to know about the particle. So if you knew everything about the shape, just from the shape of the wave and what those wiggles look like, you could tell me then what the energy is of the particle, what the velocity is of the particle, all those sort of, of things. Now, we have this word quantum mechanics, uh, and mechanics means how things operate. Quantum, what does quantum mean? Quantum just means quantized. So quantized just means that something comes in whole numbers. So an example of something that's quantized is the number of unopened Coke cans in your refrigerator. Uh, you may or may not know that uh, at Purdue University we favor Coca-Cola. If you're a student, you know what I'm talking about. So right here I have my actual bottle of Coca-Cola. So this is a demo that must use Coca-Cola. It's in the contract. Anyway, um, <laughs> the number of unopened Coca-Cola cans that are in your refrigerator is quantized. You, you can have four unopened Coca-Cola cans. You can have six unopened Coca-Cola cans. Maybe you splurged, they were on sale at Walmart, and you bought the 24-pack. But you can't have three and a half unopened Coke cans, right? So that's an example of something that's quantized. It comes in whole numbers. It comes in little discrete bits. So that's what we mean by the quantum part of this. There should be something that comes up in little discrete bits. Now. This might sound like a contradiction at first, right? I told you that um, there's a wave-like nature to these things, okay? Something is waving, and yet now I'm telling you something's going to come up in whole numbers. So um, how can we find whole numbers? How can we find quantized behavior inside of waves? So for that, I'm gonna need a helper, a, a, a volunteer, a brave person to come up and help me demonstrate. Oh, I saw your hand go up first, awesome. So. Um, no volunteers have been harmed in the making of this demonstration in the past, and that's the only guarantee I'm gonna give. What's your name? Elias. Elias, nice to meet you, how are you? All right, so come on, uh, we're gonna try not to stand too far in front of the um, projector there. Sure, so I just need you to hold one end of this, and I'm gonna hold the other end. We're gonna put some waves on the slinky. This is the quantum slinky. Can everybody see the quantum slinky? All right, all right, okay, okay, nice, nice, nice. All right, so now your job is to just hold it still and we'll see what kind of wave patterns we can get on here, all right? So the first wave pattern I wanna show you is just a really simple one. Yep, yep, you're doing a great job, just holding it still. Okay, so just kinda of notice there's a nice regular motion going on there, okay? All right, okay, hold your end nice and still, okay? All right, now I'm gonna to try to do something that looks a little bit different on here, okay? So there's a different type of wave I could put on here, okay? So this wave looks different from the first, right? It's, what's different about it? Twice the frequency. Okay, all right, it's, it's moving around faster. What else is different about it? Yeah? It's got two parts. It's got two parts to it. So it's got this one lump and the other lump. All right, let me, that's, yeah, it's amplitude is less. All right, let's try for the third one. That, so what I showed you was what's called the first mode. And then I showed you the second mode. It has two little lumps in it. And if we can get the third mode going, that'll have three little lumps in it. So let's see if, oh, you know, you hold it still. <laughs> All right. So yeah, you try to hold it up just a little bit so the people in the back can see. We're gonna go for the third mode here. Okay, so there we've got the third mode. What do you notice about the third mode? Elias is working hard, you okay? Okay, all right, should've had him wear gloves. Okay, so the third mode is? Oh, you all right? Okay, faster, right? Okay, all right, let's see how high we can go. I don't know, we'll just see. Sometimes I can get all the way up to five. All right, let's just try. It's hard. 
Okay, looks like we got we got four. <laughs> All right. Okay. All right, everybody give Elias a big hand. So what I wanted to show you with the quantum slinky, specially ordered from Edmund Scientifics, is that there are modes on the quantum slinky, okay, just as there are with, with any waves. There are modes, and the modes are distinct, okay? So there's this lowest energy mode where it's got a particular frequency to it, and it's got a particular shape, right? So if I showed you the shape, you could tell me something about the frequency, right? And then I do the next one, and again, just from the shape of what the wave looks like, you could tell me something about the frequency because it's going at a faster rate now. And then I probably can't do the third one again without Elias's help. All right, so this is the sense in which quantized numbers, okay, whole numbers come up in quantum mechanics. There's a wave back there, but the wave itself can do particular things, make particular shapes. And so the shapes are the things that come up in quantized bits, okay? So what the particle is doing then is controlled by the shape of that wave. So that means properties are going to be quantized in quantum mechanics. I said some of the things that are contained in the shape of the wave are the position of the particle, the energy of the particle, its velocity, those kinds of things. So because the shapes of the waves come up in quantized modes, that means that things like energy are going to have discrete values in quantum mechanics, and things like velocity are gonna have discrete values in quantum mechanics. So a quantum particle can't just go at any speed it wants. It can't go you know, five miles an hour versus six miles an hour. It's gonna have well-defined particular velocities that correspond very much like, like these modes. So let me tell you a little bit about some of the strange things that happen in quantum land. Uh, this part's called measurements part one. So I'm gonna tell you about what it's like to take measurements on quantum mechanical objects. So what, what we're, one of the things we're interested in in science is to take measurements in the laboratory and find out the way the world really works. And so in taking measurements on quantum mechanical objects, it turns out some very strange things happen. So this one's called measurements part one, how to sit in three chairs at once. So we talk about this shape of the wave of the particle, okay, and the shape of the wave tells you the properties of the particle. It'll tell you its position, its energy, how fast it's going, those sorts of things. And all of that we call the state, the quantum state, okay? So you can either talk about the wave or you can talk about the state. They're actually the, uh, encoding the same kind of information and the state is just whatever the particle's doing. So let me contextualize this. Let's say that we have a quantum particle Okay, this will be our quantum particle. And it's gonna be in the quantum living room where quantum effects are large enough that we can see them with our naked eyes. And in this quantum living room, I have a couch and I have a tree. And so if we say that the state is just whatever the particle's doing right now, the particle is in the tree state, okay? Because that's where it is. It's in the, on the tree state. I could um, look at it then not from the particle perspective, but from the wave perspective. So if I look at it from the wave perspective, what that means is that the shape of the wave has to be flat anywhere that's not the tree. And then since the particle's in the tree, the wave is wiggling a lot in the tree, but not outside of the tree. So that's what that corresponds to. So this is what um, the in the tree state would look like if you could actually see the wave directly. Now, here I've moved the particle. Now the particle's in the on the couch state, okay? You're getting a sense for what states mean. The state of a particle just tells you what it's doing. So right now the particle's sitting on the couch. It's in the on the couch state, we'll call it. And that means that its wave is wiggling only on the couch. So the wave here is flat, and then it's wiggling on the couch. So remember the particle is somewhere in the wiggly part of the wave, but it's not in the flat part of the wave. So now, measurements in a laboratory, when we do measurements in a laboratory, we have equipment and we're measuring something that the particle does and then a number comes out of that measurement and then we say we've learned something about the state of the particle. We might measure its energy, we might measure its position, things like that. It's very analogous to asking the particle questions about what it's doing, okay? So let's say, for example, we wanted to take a measurement on its position, that's equivalent to asking the particle a question. Hey. Where are you, right, okay? So I could, I could ask you in the front, oh, hey, hey, where are you? You're right here, right? <laughs> in the, actually, the second row. Um, 
So we'll ask the particle that question, okay? We'll say, hey, where are you, all right? So measurements are very much like asking questions. And then once we've asked the question in the lab, we're gonna get an answer back. So in this case, the particle was already in the on the couch state. We asked it, where are you? And it replied, I'm on the couch, okay? Because it was already in, an, in a state um, where it was sitting on the couch. Now, it turns out that in uh, quantum mechanics, now, because the particle has a wave nature, okay, I can actually make a wave wiggle in more than one spot, right? So before, we had a wave that was only wiggling on the couch, and then it was in the on the couch state, or it was only wiggling in the tree, and it was on the in the tree state. But here, I'm gonna make the wave, that's a wave, a wave can do a lot of different things. So I'm gonna make a wave that's flat, and then wiggles some in the tree and then goes flat again, and then wiggles some on the couch and then goes flat again. So now, where's this particle? It's somewhere in the wiggly bits, right? But there are a lot of wiggly bits, right? So there are wiggly bits over here in the tree and there are wiggly bits over there on the couch. So I can write down a wave, because waves can do a lot of different things, right? I mean, my slinky, even though I showed you the regular modes, I could do really kind of weird stuff as well. So waves can do a lot of different things. So here I've, I've added two waves together. Well, there's still one particle, but I, I have I've made it so that I have a wiggly, part, uh, wiggly bit here and a wiggly bit there. So this is 30% in the tree and 70% on the couch. So now we have this dilemma. It's not really clear what we're going to get now. When we ask the particle, where are you? When we take a measurement on it in the laboratory and we say, where are you? We don't really know what we're going to get, okay? Now the nice thing about this is that because of the wave nature, if you were a quantum particle, okay, or if quantum effects were um, large enough to be a uh, second nature in, in, in our everyday life, then you wouldn't have to figure out where to sit in the movie theater, right? If you go to the movies by yourself, it's no big deal, you sit in your favorite spot, but uh, my husband and I have been married 22 years, and so we have a lot of experience with this dilemma of we walk into a movie theater and we go, where do you want to sit? I don't know, where, you, where do you want to sit? Well, what we really mean is, well, I know where I want to sit, but I want to sit next to you more than I want to sit where I really want to sit, right? Okay, so we end up sitting somewhere that we're not quite both happy. But here, you can, in quantum world, you could sit in both the front row and the middle row and the back row all at the same time. You would just have to take your wave, okay, and make it wiggle a little bit in the front row, make it wiggle a little bit in the middle, and make it wiggle a little bit in the back. So this kind of solves that whole movie theater dilemma. So now I want to tell you a little bit more about measurements, and that's the idea that observers disturb what they measure. So in making measurements in a laboratory, we always have to disturb the system a little bit in order to find information out about it. You may feel like it's possible sometimes to make a measurement without really disturbing something, but actually we're always disturbing it a little bit. Even if I make a simple measurement, say of the length of the table with a ruler, I still have to have something that lets me read things off, and that would be shining lights on the thing and shining photons off, and actually the photons are having to, to, to hit the table and interact with a, a little bit. So we always disturb what we measure, but in Quantum mechanics, the disturbances can be extreme, okay? So extreme that the analogy we like to use is it's kind of like, I've got this baseball batter with a uh, chandelier. It's sort of like blindfolding somebody with a baseball bat and sending them into a big warehouse and saying, find the crystal chandelier. And all they've got is this baseball bat and they can't see where they're walking, okay? So they're just gonna kind of walk around whacking things until they hear, the breaking chandelier. So that's kind of an analogy for what quantum measurements tend to be like. We disturb what we measure, okay? Uh, we, we cause it to change quite a bit. So some of the strange things are that the wave can do anything, okay? A, a wave can do whatever a wave can do. But then when we go to make measurements, okay? When we make measurements, now it's like asking the particle a question, okay? And it turns out that the particle, this is where it gets very strange, whenever I ask a particular question, the particle is constrained to then snap into a state that allows it to answer that question, okay? So for example, in that, when I had the particle wiggling partly on the tree and partly on the couch, 
in order to answer my question of where are you, it would have to change what it was doing in order to be one or the other. Um, and so it turns out only certain uh, answers are allowed when we ask questions. It's kind of like a, like a bad government form, okay? Quantum measurement forms can be like that. So if anybody's ever filled out a bad government form that has these little check boxes that don't quite work for you, you know, maybe it asks for your ethnicity, please check one. That doesn't work for most people, right? So it's kind of like, kind of like that. It's like a like a bad form you have to fill out. Or another good analogy is like a like a spinning coin. So so for example, this is a this is a quantum coin. I don't know if you know how to make a quantum coin out of an old <laughs> CD. Okay, so here I have heads on one side and I have tails on the other side. And so I'm gonna use this as an analogy for making a measurement in quantum mechanics. So let's say, for example, I'm gonna flip the quantum coin, maybe it'll land on the table. Okay, and then I could, after I flip it, I could ask, is it heads or tails? That would be like making a measurement on a quantum object, and here it came up tails. People in front can verify it says tails. So that was pretty straightforward, and I could do it again, and I don't know what I'm gonna get, but I got, got tails again, okay? Now, those were easy, okay? When the, when the CD is lying flat, it's, it's like it's in a pure state of heads or tails, but what if, what if I did something strange to it, and now I try to ask the question, is it, is it heads or tails, right? It's kind of neither at the moment. And quantum mechanics is very much like this often, okay? We can often find that quantum particles are in some state that's neither. It doesn't, doesn't really fit into the question we're asking. And then we go asking a question, and it turns out that in order to answer the question, the particle has to snap into a pure state of the question we asked. So an example would be like this. Are you heads or tails? Whoa. I had to disturb the system in order to measure that, and I, this time I got tails. Now, do you think I could control whether it came up heads or tails? No, I did not control, I'm, I'm certainly not that talented. So I can prepare quantum systems in a state that is neither heads nor tails, and then when I smack it down, and in order to make a measurement, I disturb the system and then an answer comes up. So this is a great analogy for how a lot of measurements go in quantum mechanics. So for example, back to our quantum particle sitting in its quantum living room, if we were to make a measurement on that particle in the quantum living room and ask it, where are you? Okay, so that's making a position measurement, we would call it in the lab, but it's just like asking the particle, hey, where are you? As soon as we ask the question, the particle has to give us an answer, and it's only allowed to give us one answer, it's just not allowed to answer, well, I'm 30% over here and 70% over there. It has to give us one and only one answer, and the answer must correspond to the question we asked, very much like snapping the, uh, the coin down. So here's our official quantum measurement form. We'll ask the particle, where, where are you? And you can only choose one. So it's got to respond something on the form. It's got to respond either on the couch or in the tree or on the ceiling or behind the door, but it can give one and only one answer, and it must be a simple answer to the question that we asked. Only certain answers are allowed. The answers have to correspond to what's called pure states associated with the question being asked. So let's see. All right. When we did this before, okay, the first time we tried this, when we had the particle in an easy kind of state, okay, so let's put it back on the couch. So now I've got the wave, it's flat everywhere, and the wave is flat here, and then it's gonna wiggle some on the couch, and then it's gonna quit wiggling. So the particle's somewhere in there. And now if we ask it, hey, where are you? We fill out the quantum measurement form. It has to give us an answer that corresponds to the question we asked. It has to check off the quantum measurement form. And in this case, it's gonna reply, I'm on the couch, because it was already in a state, in a wave shape that corresponded to the question that we asked, okay? So that was easy, because the wave started off in a pure state of position. Well, let's go back to the case where the wave is wiggling in two places. So we'll let the wave wiggle a little bit in the tree, and then we'll let the wave wiggle a little bit on the couch. And now let's ask, us, ask it a question. We'll take a measurement now, and we'll say, okay, where are you, particle? And remember, we've prepared it so that it's wiggling, 30% of its wiggliness is over here in the tree, and 70% of its wiggling is on the couch. So again, quantum mechanics forces the particle to snap suddenly into an allowed state that corresponds to the question we asked. So we ask it, where are you? And the options are, it must respond one of these, 
on the couch, in the tree, on the ceiling, something that makes sense when we ask the question, where are you? So we don't know what's gonna happen, okay? But it could answer something that you know has a little bit of what it's already doing. So it was already a little in the tree, a little in the couch, we asked the question and it suddenly has to just snap into one. And it's got a 70% chance of snapping onto the couch and answering, hey, I'm on the couch. And it's got a 30% chance of snapping into the tree and saying, okay, I'm in the tree. But the act of asking the question, the act of doing the measurement, forced it into a pure state. Just like you know when I spin the coin and ask it, are you heads or tails? I finally got heads, by the way. Okay, all right. In order to answer the question, I had to smack it. Okay, so here, in order for the particle to answer the question, it had to snap into a pure state. That's weird. Anybody, anybody else think that's kind of weird? Okay, that's weird. All right, so that is something very strange that happens um, in, in quantum mechanics. So, so let's just think about what, what happened there. That was weird. So here's what happened. Asking the question, which is like taking a measurement in a lab, forced the particle into an allowed state of that measurement. I asked it where it was. It was forced in order to answer the question. It had to snap into a pure state, which corresponded to the question I asked. It was a sudden and uncontrollable change. And the prior state that it was in, the fact that it was 30% wiggly on the tree and 70% wiggly on the couch, all that did was set the probabilities, okay? It's like that kind of set what kind of die we picked up. So the wave, or sometimes we call it the wave function, if you're gonna describe it mathematically, you'll call it the wave function. If you're thinking about just the physics of it, it's, it's just a wave. So the wave is the real truth about what the particle's actually doing, and it tells everything. Some of the quantum weirdness comes up because we can't measure the waves directly. If we could measure waves directly and just read off exactly what they're doing without disturbing them, then we would know everything about what the particle's doing. But it turns out that we can't do that. Nobody's thought of a way. We don't think it's ever going to be possible to directly measure the wave like that. <clears throat> We're stuck measuring other things like position, velocity, energy. And because we're stuck asking questions like that that don't really make sense for a wave, okay, and then the wave has to snap into some pure state that corresponds to the question we asked, and it has to fill out our quantum measurement form, that's where the weirdness comes in. If we could just see the waves, right, if we could just see exactly what they're doing, and when you write down mathematics that, sh that says exactly what the wave's doing, things become very clear. It's just that we have no way to measure what that wave is actually doing. We're stuck measuring other things. So that's where a lot of the weirdness comes in, is, is, is that problem. So again, with the spinning uh, coin um, analogy, uh, we asked it, hey, are you heads or tails? And <laughs> I keep really disturbing, but that's a great analogy, okay? I have no control over, did it become heads or tails? But in order for it to answer the question, it had to snap into a pure state. There was a 50-50 chance. In the particle case, we asked, where are you? The particle was actually this is where it gets really fun too. The particle really was in two places before we asked. It really was. And if, if we were in quantum land, you could be in two places at once too. Wouldn't that be nice? Okay, so it really was in two places before we asked. The measurement forced it to give us a pure answer. And in the case of the particle, it had a 30-70 chance. So there, well, okay. Um, by measuring, we choose an allowed set of, of answers. So one of, the, one of the things that will come up if you have discussed this at 3 a.m. at coffee shops or intend to discuss this at 3 a.m. in coffee shops when things get very philosophical, you'll hear this phrase come up. You'll hear the phrase, observer determines reality in quantum mechanics. Okay, so this has a this is a phrase you'll actually see in the in the quantum literature. It has a very specific meaning within within quantum mechanics, and taken out of context, it's it sort of sounds rather wild. But what we mean by that is, is in a very very limited sense, yes, observer determines reality. But what we mean is that by measuring, we choose the allowed set of answers that the particle can give. Okay. That's what we mean. So in the case where our particle was wiggling on the tree and wiggling on the couch, it didn't have a well-defined position before we asked. It just didn't, okay? Where was it? Well, it was kind of both, right? 
When we asked the question, where are you, then it had a well-defined position. So there wasn't an answer to that question before we asked it. That's the sense in which observer determines reality. We all regret that that phrase made it into the literature because it sounds a little too extraordinary for what's really happening. By measuring, we just choose the allowed set of answers. We never choose the actual answer in the same way as every time I smack that coin down, I have no control over whether it's going to come up heads or tails. It's sort of like every time we make a measurement, it's like we're rolling dice. But we, by picking up, uh, by choosing which kind of measurement to make, it's like we pick, you know, we, we control what type of die we pick up. Does it, anybody here play role playing games where you get to have the really interesting, yeah, okay, where you get to have the really interesting die, some, you know, this is a six sided dice or D6 in the RPG language, okay. Um, you can have D20, you can have all sorts of strange things. So when we choose a measurement to make, it's like we get to choose which kind of die we pick up. And then, of course, after that, we, we roll the die, and we, do, you know, we have no control of what's going to come up. In that case, I got a one, <clears throat> but I certainly didn't control the outcome. So if you hear the phrase, observer determines reality at 3 a.m. in a coffee shop, now you know what it means. And you can have a better argument, I hope. Now, is it, oh, is it really a dice roll? We don't like this. That's weird, okay? That's weird. Is it really a random event? Is there really, are there really fundamentally <laughs> random things happening in the universe? And as far as we can tell, yes, okay? So as far as we can measure and as far as we can test that idea, yes, there's something really random going on there. And it turns out that the particle doesn't even know what answer it's going to give to your question until you ask the question. So in the case of the particle that was 30% in the tree and 70% on the couch, it did not have some checklist like, you know, customer service or something like that. It didn't have the detailed checklist of, Psst, if you're asked where you are, snap into the couch state. It doesn't have that script. It really is when you ask that question, it suddenly in a probabilistic way goes into one of those allowed answers. And we've tested that and tested that, and yes, it actually seems to be the way the world actually works. This was experimentally confirmed by what's called Bell's inequality, which showed us that there aren't any hidden variables. There's no hidden script. The particle doesn't pull out some script it got ahead of time that tells it what to do if you ask a particular question. So in fact, when Einstein complained, this can't be right, God doesn't play dice, it turns out he was wrong. There really are probabilities underlying quantum events. So then you have to ask yourself, okay, so now, now you imagine yourself in this coffee shop and now it's 3.30 a.m., okay, maybe you've had too many espressos or cappuccinos or something, and really, is the whole world random? That is the next thing that's going to come up, right? Is the whole world random? All right, no, it turns out it's not. You know how I know the world is not random? Casinos make money, right? Okay, so casinos make money off of randomness, right? How do they make money off of randomness? Okay, every single dice roll that happens in the casino is random, we hope. We assume they're using fair dice. Okay, let's assume they're using fair dice and everything's fair, which I'm sure they are. Every single dice roll is random, and yet casinos make money night after night after night, right? So what happens is that even though a particular dice roll is random, okay, and even though a particular deal of the cards is random, if you roll dice enough times, I know exactly what you're gonna get, right? If we all just sat here and took a pair of dice and we rolled it a thousand times or a million times, I know exactly how many times you're gonna get snake eyes. I know exactly how many times you're gonna get double sixes. And the more you roll the dice, the better my prediction comes as to what you're gonna get, okay? A single dice roll, I cannot predict. A thousand dice rolls, I can tell you the probabilities of what you'll get, and a million dice rolls, I really know how many times those things are gonna happen. So that's how casinos make money. So it turns out that if you think of very large objects, okay, for the purposes of this demonstration, I'm gonna consider myself to be a very large object, but please don't quote me on that later. I have a lot of quantum particles that make up my body, okay? And there's a lot of quantum particles that make up anything you can hold in your hands. So anything macroscopic like that, anything that's a very large object for the purposes of this talk, becomes deterministic again in its behavior, 
that we can observe because there's so many quantum events that correspond to moving this thing around or there's so many quantum events that correspond to moving my body from one spot to another. Way, 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 way more quantum dice rolls than correspond to a single night at a casino, okay? So in that sense, Large objects, macroscopic objects, become deterministic again. Deterministic just meaning we can make predictions about exactly what will happen. So the whole world is not random. It's random if you look at a single particle. But if you look at enough, okay, then, um, then it's not random anymore. Any guesses as to how many particles are in my quantum die? Yeah? Billion? Yeah. Million or billion? Billion. Can I have more? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Who's got another guess? It's bigger, it's bigger than 80 billion. How many, roughly how many particles are in my quantum die? Another guess? Don't be shy. Very many. Very many, excellent. That's correct. Yes? Avogadro's number, okay. So we have maybe some chemists in the room. Anybody remember how big Avogadro's number is? Okay, yeah, so six times 10 to the 23 particles. Anything you can hold in your hands has at least an Avogadro's number or about an Avogadro's number in it. So 10 to the 23, I should have remembered how many millions and billions and trillions that is. But anyway, 10 to the 23, I probably don't have to tell this crowd, is one with 23 zeros after it. So it's a, an insanely large number, let's call it that. So anything you can hold in your hands has so many quantum particles in it and so many quantum events that it becomes even more deterministic than predicting whether a casino will make money that night or rather predicting how much money it'll make. All right, I promised to tell you how to speed without getting a ticket, okay? So now it's time for quantum police and what's called the uncertainty principle or how to speed without getting a ticket. So here's our quantum police. And what he's gonna end up saying to us is, I know you're speeding, now where are you? <laughs> okay, so it'll turn out that if the quantum police actually measures your speed, they won't be able to find you to write the ticket. So here's why, it's called Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. All right, and it's stated like this, the more we know about a particle's position, the more we know about where it is, the less we know about its momentum, okay? Momentum, just think about speed for the purposes of this talk. It's how, it's, it corresponds to how fast the particle's going, okay? So the more we know about where it is, the less we know about its speed. And it turns out that the converse is also true. The more we know about its speed, the less we know about where it is. That's Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. All right, and it turns out that that's actually built in to, um, it's actually built into the fabric of how these things work. It's not just that we don't know, it actually has to do with what's really going on uh, in the quantum mechanics. So let me give you, let me walk, you, walk you through the example of the particle in the quantum living room. So let's put the particle back in the on the couch state, which is where the wave isn't wiggling, except on the couch a little bit, okay? So it's in 100% on the couch state. And the Heisenberg uncertainty principle would tell us, the more we know about where the particle is, the less we know about its speed, and the more we know about how fast it's going, the less we know about its speed speed, okay, vice versa. So let's say that we just asked it, hey, where are you? Okay, and it comes back with the answer on the couch, right? Remember, every time we make a measurement, it's like asking the particle a question. It then has to fill out our quantum measurement form, which has specific, discrete, allowed answers, and it must choose one and only one. So we asked, where are you? It snapped into a state that corresponded to our question, so it's on the couch now, because it told us I'm on the couch, and it's 100% on the couch state. Turns out if I ask it again, where are you? It's gonna keep giving the same answer, okay? It's got a 100% chance of telling us that now. But let me change the question now. Now I'm gonna ask it, how fast are you going? So now I've switched the quantum measurement form that it has to fill out. It must now give me an answer, one and only one answer on the quantum measurement form. My question is, how fast are you going? It could tell me really fast, really slow, medium speed. And it turns out, because of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, since we already knew its position exactly, we know nothing about what speed it's gonna tell us. There's no telling what answer it's going to give. So, how fast are you going? There's no telling what answer it's going to give. The particle itself does not know, but when we ask the question, it's forced to tell us, and so it snaps into something and says, gosh, you had to ask. Okay, so now it changed its state completely to correspond to a question that we asked. It turns out 
Whereas states that correspond to position look mostly flat and wiggle only in one spot and then go flat again. States that correspond to speed wiggle everywhere, all right? So they're actually everywhere, okay? Turns out that this is a general property of waves. This isn't uh, just about quantum mechanics. So Heisenberg's uncertainty principle applies to every kind of wave, and it applies to quantum mechanics because quantum mechanical particles have waves associated with them, but it actually applies to every kind of wave. It applies to sound waves, it applies to uh, water waves. Um, so all waves have uncertainty, and it's because of this. The momentum or the speed, think of speed, is related to the wavelength of the wave, okay? The wavelength is just the repeat distance of the wave. That's what a wavelength is. So to find the wavelength of a wave, I'm looking for something that repeats and I wanna see the repeat distance. So I might find the top of the wave, the crest, and look again for the next crest. And I'd count that, that's a wavelength, okay? And then I'd count it again, that's another wavelength. To be really sure of a measurement, we have to take the measurement a few times. That reduces the error bars, it increases our certainty, we say it reduces uncertainty. So to be really sure of a measurement, we do the, the measurement repeatedly. So if I wanna be really sure of the repeat distance of the wave, I actually have to see it wiggle several times, right? I'm gonna to have to say, okay, there's the wavelength, there's the wavelength, there's the wavelength. But in order to be really sure of the repeat distance by watching it several times, that means it had to wiggle many times, which means it's spread out all over the place. So if I put it into a pure state of speed, where I really know exactly what the wavelength is, it's everywhere. So this is you. <laughs> if, you if you're speeding in quantum land and the cop figures out that you're speeding, right, points the little radar gun at you and forces you to answer the question, how fast are you going, then snap, you snap into a state of pure speed. If you're in a state of pure speed in quantum mechanics, you're everywhere, okay? So now you're all over the universe, so yeah. The quantum police knows how fast you're going, but they can't give you the ticket, okay? Because they can't find you. You're everywhere, exactly. How are they gonna find you to write the ticket? Good luck with that one. So, and this is actually, uh, this is just a property of all waves. All waves do this. And so we can think about it in the, in the reverse way. To be really sure of the position of where the thing is wiggling, we need it to be flat most of the time and only wiggle a little bit and then go flat again. That gives us a very sharp wave that's really in one particular spot. But if I have a very sharp wave that's really in one particular spot, there's not enough repeats for me to know what the speed is. And it turns out that, it, in fact, I need several different speeds to make that kind of wave. So they, they go hand in hand like this. So, so here's our quantum police. Yes, he measured your speed. He pointed the quantum radar gun at you. You went into a pure speed state to answer that question. Maybe, maybe you were going 75 miles per hour in a 70 zone, but that means you wiggled all over the place and now you're everywhere. So he can't find you to write the ticket. All right. So uh, I thought I'd also kind of close with some quantum myths. These are the things where, and again, I don't recommend you do this, but if you were to plug in quantum mechanics in your Google search engine, you will get some very strange ads after that. And, and so the strange ads will have some of these quantum myths in them. They'll say weird things like this. They'll say quantum mechanics means I can control or create my reality because what they're doing is they're taking this phrase, observer determines reality, lifting it out and saying, ah, oh, therefore I can create reality with quantum mechanics, okay? And I get these kind of ads because I, I search for strange physics things. Um, so the quantum truth is that I don't actually get to create reality in quantum mechanics any more than I controlled how the dice was gonna come up when I, when I rolled the die. In fact, I have even less control over outcomes in quantum mechanical realms than I did in, in large scale objects that are, that are what we call classical mechanics that doesn't obey quantum mechanics. Um, so we can force the particle into new states, but the outcome is uncontrollably random. We have no control over exactly what it does. So it's actually, it's far less control than we're used to having or thinking we have in our, in our everyday lives. So observer, Observer um, affects reality, you could say that, okay? But we don't control the outcome. 
All right, another quantum myth is that it takes a conscious observer to change the state. That's because um, in the quantum literature, there's this phrase that the observer does something, the observer makes a measurement. Uh, it turns out that that word observer, we don't mean that it needs to be a, a conscious being by, by any means. It's an observer in quantum mechanics is just something that's taking a measurement. It could be a piece of equipment. Okay, it could be a, a ruler, it could be a device that you left there to take the data for you. There's no consciousness involved in that step. So in fact, observers don't have to be conscious Okay, in the, in the quantum language of that. Any inanimate measurement device will do. So it actually has uh, nothing to do with, you know, it doesn't, doesn't take a conscious mind to be causing these quantum uh, events. Uh, it just takes a, a measurement and you could, you could set up a a computer to do that for you. Oh, here's a good quantum myth. Okay, I actually heard this one recently uh, on the Purdue campus last year. We had a uh, philosophy of science. Uh, uh, actually, I think he's head of philosophy of science at Duke University, if I remember. Alex Rosenberg was here about a year ago, and he he made this interesting argument. He's a very very deep, smart guy, and he made this interesting argument that quantum mechanics has uncaused events. So maybe the universe is an uncaused event. Maybe the existence of the universe is an uncaused event. Okay, now we're at 4 a.m. right in the uh, in the coffee shop. Right now we really moved on to, to heavy deep stuff here. So I take issue with this statement, and let me tell you why. The origin of this statement that quantum mechanics has uncaused events. Actually, what he was describing is a radioactive decay. So let me tell you what that is. Um, you know what atoms are? Yes, things are made up of atoms. Regular matter is made up of atoms. Inside of atoms, uh, you'll find there's an electron or several electrons swarming around. Okay, Inside there is a nucleus, which is very, very tiny. And it's made up of neutrons and protons. And the neutrons and protons uh, can, can cause strange radioactive decays to happen, okay? The number of protons sets, the, sets what type of atom it is, if it's carbon or oxygen, that sort of thing, you just count the protons. But inside the nucleus, sometimes a quantum event can happen that looks like this. A proton will decide, yeah, I'm really a neutron trapped in a proton's body, and it'll have what's called a radioactive decay event. It'll uh, uh, eject a particle and convert itself into a neutron. All right, that's called a radioactive decay. The, uh, it can do, you know, a, a neutron can do the same thing. It can spontaneously radioactively decay into a proton. So these radioactive decay events, uh, we can predict that they will happen, we can predict with what frequency they happen, we can predict what the initial and final states are, but no one actually can tell you exactly when that particle will decide to have its radioactive decay. So if I gave you a radioactive element, okay, a single atom of a radioactive element, nobody could tell you when it's going to decay. You just know it will decay. Okay? So, uh, so uh, Professor Rosenberg was quoting this as, a, as an uncaused event, but I take issue with that language there. And that those radioactive events are caused, we know what causes them, we know the kind of nuclear forces involved in that event happening. We can't predict exactly when it'll happen, but we're 100% sure they will happen, and we know exactly why they happen. So in that sense, they're caused events, um, just that the timing is not something we can predict. All right, so those are some fun quantum myths that'll come up at 4 a.m. in the coffee shop. And I just want to end there with a great quote by Richard Feynman. Richard Feynman was a Nobel Prize winning physicist, and he had this to say about quantum mechanics, and he's a smart guy. He made up a lot of quantum mechanics, by the way. And when I say made up, I mean discovered, okay? Uh, figured it out, smart guy. He says, if you think you understand quantum mechanics, you don't understand quantum mechanics. So I hope by the end of this, you don't understand quantum mechanics. How about that? All right, I'll be done, and let's let's take some questions. Yeah, you have a question. Yes, um, I am in high school currently, and my physics class we're discussing uh, probability and things. Uh, and we're talking about how it's used in laboratory, and we learn about from the middle of the way it's hidden. And if you ask the question of if it's heads or tails. Well, that's interesting. Okay, yeah. So, in the case of, um, in the case of your coin, 
So that's a, that's a good example. So the, the, the question was basically, if we flipped a coin, there's a 50-50 chance of coming up heads or tails. But if I don't know the answer yet, is there still a 50-50 chance? Or, or how, does, how does that work out? Um, this is where it's really helpful to keep ourselves to things that we can measure. <laughs> so quantum mechanics would tell you that all this stuff is going to work out OK as long as you don't look too closely at the details. So um, yeah, I mean, if it's already there and I just don't know what the answer is, I, I agree with you that one way of looking at, at that coin, for sure, is that it's 100% chance of whatever it already is. Um, the way this will come up in quantum mechanics is that you can actually you can actually prepare a particle in what's called a mixed state. So for example, the spinning coin state is, is kind of a mixture of heads and tails, right? So nobody knows at this point what it'll be until I smack it down. Um, yeah, I kind of rambled about your question. Does that kind of help a little bit? I don't think I gave you any answers that you didn't already have. <laughs> OK, yeah. Yeah, question here. Yes. Um, so I'm so a little bit confused about the superposition that I'm talking about. I guess it would be the true frequency state and the um, cap state. Um, the way I thought, I thought I had this square, but like I said, I can't really understand. Um, but I thought it was a matter of kind of like, I guess, time dilation. So once you start moving at um, towards the uh, closer to the speed of light, time moves differently. And so therefore, there's a problem. Kind of be in two places at once, just from the fact that, and I don't know if that makes sense. Um, so I guess my question is, if you can, my question is, if you can kind of really explain. Um, okay. So. Um, I think you're, so you've brought in some relativity, which I very carefully avoided discussing, because quantum, I understand, and relativity I understand, but quantum relativity <laughs> gets very difficult um, for, for exactly the, the reason you just brought up. You know, you can, you can, when you start to think about special relativity, for example, exactly when something happened, becomes a matter of who's observing it. So then things can get very dicey. And I don't think we have a really good explanation or understanding of what's going to happen with some of these quantum events at relativistic speeds, okay? because of exactly what you're talking about. Now, what typically happens, though, in these strange paradoxes, what typically happens is that for the things that you can measure, you can run the calculation anyway, and you will get the right answer. Okay, so a lot, a lot of times it just boils down to um, the questions that can be asked in the laboratory are the same things that can be calculated by the mathematics, and so those things work out. But without going into a lot of details of, of we'd have to do a whole special talk on special relativity to combine the two. Yeah, did that kind of, it doesn't address your question at all. I haven't, haven't taught you anything there other than to say it's a, that's a difficult problem to combine the two, quantum and relativity. Well, in a way, give me another question. Though. So if you can find different ways to ask questions, you could, or ask different questions, you can give different answers. Different yeah, yeah. I agree with that. Yeah, you have a question. Elias, right? Uh, yeah. Um, if you had two observers at the same time, but they don't know each other at the same time, and one of them is observing speed, and the other is observing placement, what would happen? Oh, excellent. OK. So good question. All right, so, so he's asking, what happens if I have two observers? One's going to observe speed, one's going to observe position. Excellent. So it turns out they just don't get to both ask at the same time. They, they have to, they can, you can make one measurement and you can make another measurement, but we don't get to do both at the same time. We, and the, I guess the, the thing that you would have to, I mean, that, that's a really clever question. Um, the thing that we would have to do is define devise a measurement device that could do both at the same time. And so when you really, it's going to turn out that when you, and I'll, I'll give you a book to read afterwards, you'll, you'll really like it. The Feynman Lectures, basically, on quantum mechanics has a great discussion about um, 
uh, exactly how to make these measurement devices. What do we mean when we're making a measurement device that measures position? What do we mean when we're making a measurement device that measures speed? And you can see in the physical setup that darn it, we can't measure both at the same time. We just can't. I know, yeah, yeah. But I highly recommend the Feynman lectures. You'll like it. Yeah. Yeah, yes? For a person of my age group, there's no concern about quantum mechanics displacing classical mechanics. That we can still believe in the yeah. Newton's law of motion. Yeah. Well, sure, there, there's no contradiction between the two. They just have their realms of applicability. Right. Yeah, so whenever you get enough quantum events together, it turns into Newton again. Yeah. Yep, and actually, we can show that mathematically. Yeah, so, so no problem. Yeah, yeah. All, all physical laws have their regimes of applicability. And when we push them farther, we often discover there's some piece to the law that we just wasn't a big enough effect for us to see before. And that's what happened with quantum. Sure. We pushed the measurements smaller and smaller, and we realized, oh, we have to go beyond Newton. Yeah. Good comment. Thanks. Yes, yes, question. Um, this might not be right, but can you explain the relationship between quantum mechanics and string theory? No. <laughs> but I can I, I can give you a flavor though. I can give you a flavor. I don't okay, so I don't do string theory. I'm what's called a condensed matter physicist. Um, we mean condensed in the sense of condensation, like uh, gas condenses to liquid, liquid condenses to solid. So condensed matter is stuff you can touch. If you can pick it up and hold it in your hand, that's my field of physics. So I don't do strings, they're too tiny, right? Um, but uh, strings are objects that um, obey some quantum mechanics. So the idea behind strings is that they actually have little modes, okay? And so they'll have a mode like this that corresponds to one particle. And then when the string has a different mode, it corresponds to a different particle. And when the string has a different mode, it corresponds to a different particle. So the idea would be that I get an electron when it's one mode, and I get a positron when it's another mode, and I get a tau lepton when it's another mode. So it's a beautiful, Beautiful idea. Um, and string theory, part of the, the beauty of string theory is that it gives a description that takes into account both quantum mechanics and gravity at the same time. So your question in the back here about special relativity connecting back to quantum mechanics. The larger than special relativity is general relativity, which takes all that into account. So really, to get it to all work out together, string theories do that. They combine those things. Now, is all that stuff testable yet? That's where you, that's where you now here's where the, the, the rubber meets the road, is do I know that that's right? It's a good theory, it works as far as we can test it, but then to really, really test is that the thing that's actually happening, you have to give us lots of money to build really good particle accelerators, right? So, so it, it's, it's uh, anyway, it's, it's beautiful. And uh, it would be very difficult to figure out if that's really what's going on. And so just to follow up, the relationship between what you just said and um, what, what is in the talk that tells us called chaos theory. Okay. You get perturbations. Okay. How does that relate to quantum? Well, um, there's separate theories, but so the question is how does uh, chaos relate to, to quantum theory? Um, chaos, okay, a good example of a chaotic system is the weather, and I actually really mean that. So there are certain uh, systems that um, have enough what's called nonlinearities in them that the solutions, um, well, the prediction of what actually happens can diverge very rapidly. So, so chaos, what we mean by chaos is that that's when you get solutions doing such wildly different things that now I have to follow it back in time and really, really understand things on very, very fine scales in order to make the prediction. So for example, weather, we can predict the weather, well not me personally, but people who predict weather can predict weather out to about three days. Okay, past that, you'll notice it fluctuates a lot between what they're currently predicting for 10 days from now and what actually happens 10 days from now. It's because weather's a chaotic system. But if you told them, you know, if, if they had enough information, right, about exactly what was happening where with good enough models and enough big computers to, to, to chunk through the calculations, then they'd be able to predict it. 
Okay, so chaos is just this idea that what actually happens is very sensitively, very finely dependent on initial conditions, on what's currently happening. But it's entirely um, deterministic. Chaos theory is entirely deterministic. As long as you very finely understand the initial state, then you know what's going to happen. So that's, that's a major difference between chaos theory and quantum mechanics. Okay. Yes, question here. Was there a single moment when there was that realization that classical mechanics was inadequate? Mm. Single moment. Okay, that's a good question. You're asking a history of science question. Um, I'm not very knowledgeable about history of science, but as far as I understand from the physics, some of the physical phenomena that people were up against, I don't think it was a single experiment. It's rarely a single experiment that drives people to make what's called these paradigm shifts into the new idea, the new concept of, of how to describe things. So some of the things that people were seeing were um, uh, the photoelectric effect. This is where you shoot a photon into a material and a single electron comes out. Okay, that's a very quantum uh, event. There uh, was uh, evidence in, um, if you look at, at atoms and the kinds of electronic transitions they can have or molecules and the kinds of electronic transitions they can have, it's always discrete. So the energy levels of atoms and the energy levels of molecules are these very well separated discrete things and we can we can measure that actually in star spectra out to the end of the universe. Well, okay, it's not really the end of the universe, but as far as we can measure out, we see that the hydrogen atom is always the hydrogen atom. It's like they're exactly the same. There is no, it's not like you can take a hydrogen atom and carve your name on it. They're all exactly the same, darn it. How is that possible, you know? And so it turns out it's because, um, of quantum mechanics. So, so atomic spectra, we called it, which is the, this idea that the energy levels of atoms come in these very discrete numbers, that's quantized. And that's part of what drove us to, to this idea, uh, the idea of shooting an electron into a, I'm sorry, a photon into a material and kicking out a single electron. That's uh, the photoelectric effect. That's a very quantum event. Uh, we were having trouble understanding what's called black body radiation, and that also led to the quantum theory. So black body radiation is a, a terrible name, but here's the idea. The idea behind black body radiation is that anything with a temperature glows. So I am glowing right now. I'm just glowing in the infrared, and your eyes can't pick it up. But if you have night vision goggles, you would see that every person in this room is glowing. Okay? You've seen hot things glow. You've seen the, the eye of a stove glow. It glows red. Okay, so things that are even hotter start to glow in all the visible ranges and you see them as white, like the sun. So that also was difficult. Well, it had, we, we, we couldn't understand that without the quantum theory. So I'd say atomic energy levels, the photoelectric effect, and the black body radiation, all these problems kind of came together at the same time. But again, I'm not, um, I'm not terribly knowledgeable about the history of science, but those are, I think those are the big three. Would the double slit experiment be a member of that set? Yes, yes. So the double slit experiment was uh, <laughs> essentially sending electrons through slits, okay? And this was when we were trying to figure out, well, are these things waves or are they particles? And it turns out that sending one electron at a time, just one electron at a time through, through two slits, okay, so a wall with a little slit and then a wall, okay, so two little slits where it could go, could go right, could go left. Turns out, when it came out on the other side and we measured what was going on, that's the Young's two-slit experiment, it did exactly what a wave would do. It ended up on the other side looking like a wave, the data, that's what the data came back saying. So again, that's another piece of the puzzle. Yeah, so lots of really weird, strange stuff that just caused people to make that paradigm shift. Yes, question here. Do advancements in nanotechnology, are they contingent on a further understanding of quantum mechanics? Um, they're con okay, so are advancements in nanotechnology contingent on a further understanding of quantum mechanics? Um, they're not going to be contingent on new discoveries about the fundamental physics associated with quantum mechanics, but it's absolutely true that in order to push the limits of nanotechnology, we have to work out the consequences of quantum mechanics in detail. Does that kind of answer your question? So, so for example, when I teach um, uh, solid state physics for graduate students, I get 
engineers from across campus coming to that class, which has a lot of quantum mechanics inherent in it, um, because they're starting to push everything down to the nano scale and they're bumping up against quantum effects. So you're absolutely right. We have to understand and work out those consequences in order to, to nano very well. Yeah. We should maybe take like one more question and then, and then end, and I'll stick around if you want to ask me more questions. Yes? Oh, oh, meow, okay, you would like Schrodinger's cat. Um, so the Schrodinger's cat idea is a little bit like our quantum um, particle that was partly on the couch and partly in the tree. Where was that? Oh, goodness. I have to go in the different way. Oh, that's my daughter. Yes, you may all comment on how cute she is. <laughs> okay, so here's our, here's our um, particle that was um, wiggling in two places at once. So it was wiggling partly in the tree and partly, in, um, the, partly on the couch. So Schro the Schrodinger's cat experiment kind of did the following. It said, well, let's, let's prepare this kind of quantum state, and then we'll tie the result of that measurement to whether or not a cat gets killed. I love cats. I really wish they had chosen something like a spider or something to get killed. I'm okay with that. But anyway, so the Schrodinger's cat idea would be that, oops, sorry, that in the quantum living room there's going to be a cat, and when we make the measurement of is it, um, is it on the couch or is it in the tree, then as soon as that measurement takes place, if the thing snaps onto the couch, it kills the cat somehow by some terrible means. And if not, then the cat will get to live, okay? So the, the Schrodinger's cat paradox was, was proposed to, to, uh, to elucidate some of these strange things that go on. So the idea being if, well, let's say we close the door to the quantum living room and there's a quantum cat in there and there's this wave and if the wave is measured to be on the couch, the cat's gonna die. If we haven't opened the door yet, what's, is the cat alive or dead? That was the question, right? That's, that's the Schrodinger's cat question. If I haven't opened the door to look where the particle is, whether it's in the tree or on the couch, will the, will the cat live or die? Um, and that's a great um, question. It, what it, you know, at the time when people were trying to figure it out, these are the kinds of paradoxes. We would now call it a paradox, right? At the time, people may have even seen it as a contradiction. A contradiction is when two ideas are completely incompatible and cannot exist together. That's a true contradiction. A paradox is when the two ideas seem not to go together, but we'll figure it out eventually. So in the case of the Schrodinger's cat problem, a cat's too big for quantum effects. <laughs> that's, that's the resolution of, of the Schrodinger's cat problem. You'll never get a cat who's in a superposition of alive and dead states because you haven't opened the door to the quantum living room yet because the cat has at least an Avogadro's number of particles, probably even an Avogadro's number of cat hairs, according to my cat, right? <laughs> and so that's so many particles that a cat is not a quantum mechanical object, at least during the day. And so, so that's part of what that, that reveals too, is that that's, that's one of the ways out of the paradox, is the cat, the cat is not quantum mechanical. Yeah, excellent question. I should quit and, and slow. People who want to leave are free to leave, and I'll stick around and answer questions. Thanks, thanks for coming.